Hello, you're listening to the Rosenfeld Review. I'm Lou Rosenfeld. I'm really happy to have my guest today, fellow New Yorker, uh, Kat Small. Hello. Hello. Kat. Hi. It's, it's morning in, in Brooklyn. I guess it's, uh, it's a sunny day, but we're inside talking. And um, those of you who don't know Kat, she's a director of product design at All Turtles uh, and has um, some great experience both working in uh, a SaaS setting, but also working with some pretty well-known brands like NASDAQ, SoundCloud, Etsy, Asana. Uh, Kat is, uh, well, I would sort of say you're kind of uh, part of the royalty of local uh, design people. Don't cover your face. Uh, being that you have these uh, uh, good uh, three-letter programs uh, that you were part of uh, educationally here in New York, SVA and NYU. And uh, Kat also makes what she describes as awkward video games. What do you mean by <laughs> awkward video games? Oh, gosh. If it w I mean, I'm awkward in general, so I feel like, you know, everything I create is a little awkward. But I think what I mean by that is something that makes people feel slightly uncomfortable, maybe laugh, you know, in, it induces a laugh at themselves or something they've experienced in their life. I'm your man. I'm ready to <laughs> right? laugh at myself. Awkwardness. Comes natural. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, Kat, you're also um, in the conference business. What's the name of your conference? Yes. So I organized the Game Devs of Color Expo, you know, in honor of folks who love to make games. I love getting to surround myself with other creative thinkers and recognize that there was an opportunity for uh, folks who look like me or don't look like me to have a space to just kind of chat as creatives versus always just talking about like how much it is hard to be a person of color in tech, like in the diversity zoo space. So we just mostly come together and nerd out about various game development topics. And occasionally we will talk about work culture and things like that, but it's, it's more about highlighting people and also just directly giving game devs money. <laughs> and um, I think we just missed it, but the next one will probably be September, 2023. Yeah. Sometime in 2023, 23, probably in, in the September region. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll know soon. So if you're interested in uh, that, I guess Twitter is kind of weird right now, but you know, we've got a website, so you, you can Google us. Well, speaking of conferences, you're also kind enough to speak at the next Rosenfeld Media Conference, a brand new yeah. one called Design in Product. It's taking place virtually December 6, 2022. So that's coming up really soon. Um, Can't wait. And uh, this conference is really there to help people who are primarily UX designers, UX researchers, UX writers who struggle one way or another with the product world that they find themselves in and uh, not to kind of bitch and moan and, and fetch and whatever we <laughs> tend to do. But, but I love but, that. Well, that's part of uh, you know <laughs> the journey uh, yeah. and to get to somewhere more positive, more constructive, where we can be better partners with product people. And I know you've got some experience with this. So, I mean, let's start with what is in a nutshell, what is that frustration about? Why do UX people get all hot and bothered when uh, you bring up the, the word product with them? Yeah, my my personal experience has been, uh, it's a slow realization that design isn't just happening in a vacuum and that there are business constraints. And I think in my case, I went to school and got all this idealistic messaging about how design changes the world and things of that nature. And then when you're actually doing the design process, you recognize that there are all these pitfalls. Sometimes you're involved so late that you don't have the chance to actually make an impact. Do you recognize something from research and people are just like, the train's already gone. Like we just need to deliver something. And that can be really frustrating and, and cause people to, to burn out for sure. It definitely was a challenge with me. And what I've had to learn is, okay, well, everybody's got goals and I need to learn what those are and how I fit into the larger business and what assumptions people are making. And through that process, that was really 
what helped me to build better working relationships with folks versus just being adversarial, because that's definitely, I think, where it started. One of my first jobs, I definitely remember there was like a lot of us versus them. And it was like, oh, well, like design's doing everything we can, but, you know, product and engineering, that's where the real issue is. And it takes a lot of recognizing, oh, how how is this all, how are all the systems kind of fitting together to make a customer experience that nobody is is happy with? And then from there, you can actually start thinking about how to undo that. Well, so I'm hearing a couple things from you. I'm hearing challenges around relationships, uh, but also process. Yeah. So yeah, the, the, I train, think it's, yeah. the train's already left. That sounds like yeah. a process thing for the most part, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think there's there's a there's an aspect of it that's building better relationships with people. And then there's helping them understand how you can actually benefit the process by being involved earlier. I think for some folks, it's easier to stick to one of those or the other. I've had to learn over time how to navigate both of those and and to really dig into what makes my collaborators tick. And that helps me to understand how I can talk to them and get them to become advocates, essentially, to improve process, for example. Um, but yeah, it, it took years of just making a lot of mistakes <laughs> and then learning how to introspect um, and, and recognize that as a designer, for example, I was kind of for a while, just letting people tell me what to do because that was like easier and safer. And when you're also more junior, you don't fully know what you're doing. Not that we ever do, but it was easier when I didn't have the experience to just kind of let other people, you know, make the decisions. And then the more experience I got, I realized, oh, actually, you know, I need to be a more active contributor. And then, you know, that's where it becomes really important to actually talk to folks and understand how you can can benefit them and how they can benefit you and you can kind of work together to move toward toward the same outcome. Well, let's let's try that out. Let's say I yeah. am a maybe I'm 3 years into my design or, or research career. I, I may be strong at my craft, but I'm um maybe like you were some years yeah. back uh where I'm like all right, uh I I have to contend with uh, the fact that there's other people involved in the decision-making process, both in terms of process, resources, uh, they may control the the budget, uh, and I want to work with them better. Uh, where yeah. do where do I begin? What what's what based on the 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 trial and error and the school of hard knocks experiences that you had? What advice yeah. do you have for me? How do I have yeah. those conversations? Gosh, yeah, so. It can be hard. Um, like I will completely acknowledge that when you are, whether you're like a team of one person or if you're a person who doesn't have a lot of power and influence, it's probably going to be a slow build up over time until you can really make a larger impact. And hopefully you can find somebody who is a bit higher level who can advocate for you. So that's one thing that I did is I, I did start to build relationships. Even when I was at smaller companies, you know, it was with folks who were maybe like the head of product or like the head of engineering. And um, that was really helpful at one startup job I, I had in particular where, you know, I started to have better working relationships with folks. So they kind of started to understand what I, what I did and that I wasn't just there for aesthetics. And so at a smaller place, I would suggest being a little bit more open to being flexible with what you do. <laughs> um, like I think design has a lot of fuzzy boundary lines when it comes to product and sometimes can even have fuzzy boundary lines with engineering. And so it's kind of a process of, of, of talking to people and understanding what their interests are, what your interests are. And so at one job, um, I actually occasionally would do some front end development work. And that gave me a chance to build a working relationship with the engineers on the team. And then I could invite them to do to actually watch user research or I could share user research insights with them. And so that opened up a great line for us there. And then when I actually started to, I would go and talk to folks who were working on the editing 
marketing team because this was for a content management system within this like blog. And so I would start going to folks on the editing team and start to get to know them a little bit and then understand, you know, what their interests were. And then I could actually invite those folks to participate in some of the research that I wanted to do. And so there were all these little ways that I was essentially building relationships with various people across the company to help them to under like it helped me understand what they did and then i could understand ways that i could angle the things that i was interested in bringing into the company and and make it simple make it quick and all of that together helped people better understand design without me even having to really say like let me teach you about the design mm -hmm. process you know um i think making it accessible to people is is really important and then there's the element of understanding the context of what you're in. So that worked really well at a smaller startup that was like 50 people. I think at a larger company, then you really probably need to engage your skip skip level, for example. So the manager's manager, get to know that person and start to maybe have direct conversations about some of the challenging challenges you're experiencing and see if you can figure out what they're interested in and how you might be able to discuss a, an outcome that makes you both happy. Let, let's come back to the bigger setting yeah. bigger organization uh and let's start a little or dig a little more deeply into the more one-on-one -on -one. so i'm guessing like the opening gambit isn't as you were just saying it's not going to be well here's what the design process is don't you want to know about it don't you want to yeah. know about me uh maybe it's more along the lines of uh what do you need yeah. And they see it through their frame of, of product or in some cases engineering challenges that you may actually be able to help with. But um, do you have to do you ever have problems or challenges around, let's say, starting that conversation like you don't necessarily have the right language like they're talking. You, maybe you get them talking and suddenly it's over your head. <laughs> yeah, there are definitely times where uh, early on, especially before I understood business language, I was like, what does all of this mean? And in those cases, first thing I would just ask for more context. I think people are often afraid of looking dumb or silly, but it's actually quite normal as you're learning about what somebody does to have questions for them. And that is the whole point, essentially, is to understand how they work. It's it's kind of conducting research on the people that you work with and essentially doing a service design project to understand how to better work with the folks around you. And then ultimately that's going to achieve your, your outcome. It just takes longer, but it works way better <laughs> in my experience at least. So yeah, I, I, I've really tried to ask people as many questions as I can about, you know, what are these words that you're using? Like, what does this mean? I don't know. Um, and then if for some reason somebody's very standoffish or something like that, you know, you can always Google. Um, you can always take classes. I've actually taken um, some classes through, for example, Designer Fund has a great business essentials for designers mm. course that I took. And that was super duper helpful for understanding things like the total addressable market and like all these terms that business and data folks use that I didn't fully put together before. Um, but yeah, you do, you, you want to learn to speak the language of the folks around you. You do, of course, always want to understand what your objective is at the end of this process. Um, but you can't go in, or I would recommend against rather going in, you know, saying you're doing it all wrong because that's mm -hmm. going to put people on the defensive. And I've seen that so many times people get put in this position where they're essentially kind of people feel like they're nagging. And that's because folks haven't been brought along their journey yet. So it's so interesting, like, you know, you mentioned business, uh, you know, basics as one of the things that's really helpful to understand what a product person is challenged by. Uh, and that course sounds great. I imagine there's some books as well, or there's other ways to certainly brush up on that. Are there other areas uh, that you think would be really good for a uh, design person going into the setting to, to keep in mind? What are the other kind of potential blind spots they may have that product people have to live and die by? Yeah, there's there's definitely a lot around the longer term business objectives and why people are making decisions that they're making that can take a while to wrap your head around. Beyond business, I would suggest getting close with the engineering team 
I also think there's a lot of value in understanding the folks who work on data and, and analytics, those kinds of things. They do ultimately feed into the business, but it's more about defining success. And you'll notice probably that, um, <clears throat> that a lot of product managers are also pretty close with like a data or analytics mm -hmm. person. And that's because that product person's objectives are usually tied to some kind of a measurable outcome. And the data person is the one who helps to figure out what is possible to measure and what is not possible to measure. It is also as a note possible that a smaller company, they may not, they may be the same person, yeah. <laughs> but I do think it's really important to understand um, what it means to have a measurable outcome, because ultimately that's going to be what most likely confines a lot of your solutions or constrains a lot of your solutions as a designer. And the more that you can understand how success is being defined, then the better you can do. And then of course, on the side of engineering, um, better understanding the constraints that you're probably going to run into is, is also great. But I feel like a lot of designers have heard and have worked on making the engineering design connection easier. So I, I really definitely want to underscore understanding the the data side of things as well. Well, until Rosenfeld Media publishes the, the handy dandy guide to engineering for designers and its companion, the, the guide to data uh, science and analytics <laughs> for designers, are there places that you found that, that have been really good to pick up that knowledge? Gosh. Because they're both large, overwhelming, potentially. Yeah, honestly, that one has been more challenging for me to find in resource format. Mm -hmm. I have mostly learned through talking to people what and how they go about figuring out what to measure. Like data people are very, very happy to talk to you about, well, how did you come up with this number? And what exactly does this mean? Mm -hmm. Like they, they love that stuff. And there's a, definite overlap between qualitative and quantitative data and, and insights. Mm -hmm. So you can actually be a bridge between user research and analytics by talking to these folks. So honestly, I mean, I, I feel like there, there are like boot camps for data science and things like that. I, I would love to hear from folks who have actually taken or, or have read a resource that was really helpful for me. It has been mostly through conversation and direct learning. So back to conversation for a moment, um, that opening gambit, do you ever think it makes sense to like begin that conversation with someone on the product side around the elephant in the room? Are those it? wait, the elephant in the room? Yeah, the elephant in the room. <laughs> you know, or the 800 pound gorilla. I, I get my mammals mixed up, but the, mm. um, hey, you know, people like us don't always have such uh, easy times working together. Uh, have you ever found that as a, a, a worthwhile tack or does it assume hmm. too much? I think that maybe instead of, what I would do instead of making the, the, the straightaway assumption or stating that very often we we won't, we won't work together very well, or historically folks like us haven't worked together well, I would most likely come into the conversation asking how that person would like to work together. And then I can share how I would like to work together, what our ideal design product relationship would look like. And I think that kind of gets at the same outcome, but comes from a place that's a little bit more open and, and with less assumptions or with less of a a negative entering the conversation. Um, so yeah, I, I think it is great to acknowledge, Hey, you know, I think that if we don't talk about this, we're going to get off on the wrong foot. Um, but I think that coming to it from a place that's more open is at least how I prefer to have those conversations so that, you know, we, again, are, we're, we're putting things in a more positive and maybe, uh, yeah, optimistic light. Well, and the truth is, I mean, your approach really gets them talking about themselves. You ask questions. Yeah. And I think most people, unless they're just so busy, <laughs> are really happy to talk about what yeah. they do. So yes. we were talking about, uh, at a very one-on-one -on -one level, 
um, some of your experiences and, and what you've learned about working, you know, really one to one with people on the product side. Uh, and then you alluded to, and I said we'd come back to it, the broader context. You're in a larger organization where having one to ones is isn't always so easy, or you don't even know necessarily yeah. who you should be talking with. Now, uh, in these big siloed settings, do you have to take a completely different approach to forging better relationships with product? Gosh, for me, it's it's definitely involved figuring out how to scale myself. I've had situations where I was a single designer working with two or three PMs at a time, and it can be at very intense, and you can definitely get stuck in a cycle of just pushing things out to folks. Um, and for me, what I have really focused on in those moments is, is doubling or tripling down on what my goals are and then understanding um, and mapping out essentially the relationships between all of the people that I need to build relationships with in order to advance my quote unquote agenda, I suppose you so could are you, say. Are you it like, sounds very tactical. You, but you, it sounds <laughs> like you're doing a bit of uh, ethnography. <laughs> Yeah, right. It's it's really it really is like it's it's doing design for for yourself, designing your work life. There is a book called something like that, and it's probably good. Um, but yeah, I I really do feel like it is a lot of the work that that I have done to make sure that I'm essentially communicating and and setting expectations because a lot of it becomes expectation setting at that scale. Um, making sure that I'm I'm doing it in ways that are most efficient because. Maybe you have one team, but maybe the engineers on the team are, you know, there's they're they're raring and ready to go with work, and you are one person, and you're just like, whoa, okay, I got to figure out how to you know how to do this, but how to also make sure that we are, you know, in infusing customer insights at every point, and that we're moving towards something that we feel good about long term, and how do you do that when you are also kind of drowning? Um, and so for me, that was really you know sitting with the PMs on my team and saying, Hey, you know, I'm really excited about this project. And also I'm one person and we have X amount of time, uh, or we have X amount of resources or X amount of hours in the day. So let's talk about how we want to use the time that I have and the energy that I have and what support we might also need to make this move forward. So for me, a lot of the time at a larger company, it becomes really about like, again, focusing on like, we all want the same thing, people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we all want the same thing. And I, you know, want to make sure that I have time to do X, Y, and Z, you know, really important strategic thing. Let's talk about how I can be involved and, and, you know, help all of us because we all want this. And also I'm one person. <laughs> so, you know, let's, let's, let's be reasonable here um, in terms of, you know, what my capacity actually is. And people are usually pretty open to that. And then what usually happens is if uh, if I'm in a situation where there's a capacity challenge, for example, and I let other folks know, like, you know, what the expectations are around that, they can actually start to also advocate and say, hey, we actually might need another designer or like, hey, we actually might need this or, or this other specific resource. Um, and so, I mean, really it's, it's, it's kind of doubling down on like making sure that you're sharing with folks in terms of like your current state um, and, and what you need. I think, again, the challenge becomes, okay, how do you not just get stuck in execution? Because it's so, so easy to do that when everything is like moving around you and, you know, you're really, in some cases, it can feel like you're a cog. Um, and so what I tend to do in those situations is I try to flag and say, hey, I'm feeling concerned that we haven't validated this thing or how confident, like I'll ask questions sometimes, like how confident do we feel in certain decisions that we're making? And I will just float that as a question and say, hey, okay, you're saying we're feeling about 50% confident. If you would like to feel more like 75 to 80% mm -hmm. confident, here are some things that we can do. And then, you know, that's how I start moving away from execution and more toward a thought partner. So, yeah. And then well, there's those empathy moments, you know, in, in, yeah, in yeah. understanding, yeah. Uh, like acknowledging that what maybe yeah. is keeping them up at night is risk. And you're yeah, right. <laughs> reducing that. Yeah. Design is so good at reducing risk and PMs 
love that. And so if you can make it clear that that's your focus, uh, then you you become a partner for them essentially and immediately. But we take that for granted. Like we, yeah. we sort of forget that that's a lot of what we do. But I think that yeah. is very like in line with how product people think about their work. That's yeah. really a, thank you for that. That's a, that's, that's <laughs> kind of, I'm, I'm having like the, it, 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 you know, we can maybe do this post-production, put a big exclamation mark over my head right now. Uh, <laughs> the, um, do, do you, um, uh, like if, so you've, you know, you've worked with product people and all kinds of, oh, wait, before I get to this question, I did have another yeah. question. You were talking about uh, uh, like mapping out almost like an ethnographer would all these people and, and relationships and so forth. And when you were saying that, I, I envision, I, I forget what the term for this is, but it's like what detectives do on a, like on a cork board with yarn oh, yeah, and with push the pins. strings, yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, I can't remember what that's called, but um, do, do you do something like a map? Yeah, I actually go into Fake Jam and, and or, you know, whatever mapping tool you prefer these days, you can use Whimsical or any of them. There are a lot, um, Miro. And um, I, I go into, you know, my preferred tool of choice and I put down all the people that I have to work with. Mm -hmm. And, you know, occasionally I'll put, you know, information about like, OK, well, like, what are these this person's goals? And then how often should I talk to this person to make sure that we're staying aligned and connected? And I did that when I was working at Asana, which, mm -hmm. you know, they're like 1500 people. And that map was pretty large. It was probably like 20 to 30 people um, who were stakeholders across different teams. And so I actually did end up scheduling various one-to-ones with people that some of which were like maybe every two weeks, some of which were every month, every six weeks, eight weeks. Um, and it was really helpful to have an actual visuals that I could commit to. Oh, that's fantastic. So you actually are creating a, a, a map of sorts or may, is there a different word you prefer to use? Oh, I mean, me and my coach, we use the word map. Okay, <laughs> I so think, you know, it's, it's a diagram. Do you yeah. ever share that map? Because it seems Ooh. like it would be unbelievably hmm. valuable, except for the, like, maybe you want to edit it to say, well, this guy, you know, he's, he's great product manager to talk to. I really understand him, but man, he, he, you know, he needs to brush his teeth more or something, uh, you know. Yeah, I'll, <laughs> you gotta I'll, take I'll out check that with my stuff. coach and see what she thinks. I mean, she she came up with the idea, honestly. Like, I will, I cannot take credit for this. My, I work with a great coach. Her name is EO. She's amazing. And so I'll I'll chat with her. I would love to share that. I think it'd be really fun. Yeah. And, and yeah, like it was really insightful for me. And, and I think it'd be very insightful for other people too. It's one of these things that uh, like, designers may take for granted that we can whip yeah. uh, uh, up a uh, Miro and start mapping this stuff yeah. out. And it's like, wow, that, that could be invaluable for the whole organization. Okay. So now I'm going to get to that last question I had for you, yeah. which is so um, you've been working with product people in many different settings over a number of years. Uh, what have you learned about them as people? What's, what makes them tick that, may not be obvious until you've got that experience mm. what what's PMs it like to people. walk a mile in their shoes <laughs> i mean uh i definitely think one thing is uh their jobs are very ambiguous and terrifying and so that's actually why i realized that if i talk about risk reduction that was the most productive way to have a conversation with pms because their whole job is essentially a bunch of unknowns that you're hoping piece together in just the right way that you reach the successful outcome. Um, other things, I mean, yeah, like their job is really scary. <laughs> their job is terrifying. Yeah. Um, and also they have to talk to so many people. And so, you know, the more that you can also connect with other people and kind of, you know, both not just make their job easier, but you know, improve their work experience and think about things with your designerly lens in a way that maybe they wouldn't have considered it. Um, I think that they will gladly take the help of having a thought partner. And also because you can actually envision the future, that's super duper powerful. Mm. And you can, you can really help them build confidence in, um, in what they're, 
what they're hoping will will actually happen. So help them get um, to a future yeah. uh, yeah. without so much risk. Yeah, yeah, a much clearer, less terrifying future. Really, like, I mean, I I think we all don't know what we're doing, and we're hoping that, that we we've made the right guesstimates, you know. Yeah. And so, yeah, the more you can you can build that confidence, they really appreciate it. Awesome. And you know, they're they're obviously very smart, nerdy people, and all very even a little and, awkward thing, <laughs> and and pretty awkward, but in a good way. So you know, like. The classic, like figuring out how to bond with them as humans, remembering that they're just people, is is really great. So, that's uh, we've we've covered everything and then some that I really hope we we get to. Thank you so much, Kat. But I do have the last Thank question you. for you, which is, what gift have you brought for our listeners? Yeah, I really like this podcast that is called Design Life Podcast. It is by Charlie Prangry Prangley and Femke van Schoenhoven. And they often talk about scenarios like this um, and other things that I'm thinking about a lot, like going from being an individual contributor into design management. So I would definitely recommend checking that out in addition to obviously the amazing podcast that you're listening to right now. Um, and then another note, I would just like to drop some really great folks that I have wonderful conversations with about design all the time. So, um, my friend Asia Ho, she's really great and she's working at Modern Health and she's been in the design space for as long as I have. And, you know, she's, she's on the tweets and whatever else people are using now, uh, Lil Chen, also a really great designer. We have lots of awesome conversations about design management, so you should definitely reach out to her. And then lastly, if you're looking for mentorship, I love to chat with people on this service called Merit. And you can find me there if you ever want to nerd out more about any of what we've discussed today. Fantastic. Well, thanks for nerding out with us today, Kat Small. Really looking forward to your talk on December 6th at Design and Product. And uh, just great to spend time with you. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.